All right. Good evening, everybody. Honestly, didn't know if I would make this exact video since we we're out of pocket, but we got back early enough so that I can talk specifically about closing funds and not roundabout about our portfolio. So uh, my name is Daniel Young. I'm the owner and founder of Adaptive Perspective and the Adaptive Perspective social media platforms. This video continues my uh, teachings on using closed-end funds for our investment strategy. If you want the full methodology uh, and our 12 steps to financial freedom, then head, head over to Facebook and check out my page, Adapted Perspective, Navigate Your Finances, and the information will be below. Uh, but I, I give you our 12-step framework for free. Um, this is an unedited video. Who knows what you'll hear in the background as I continue to film these in my house. Uh, and I repeat, I'm not exporting these off to some random person through Fiverr who's editing them and making them all pretty. It's just raw, unfiltered, I'd say uncensored, but I, I'm not cussing on these, but it's just raw, authentic video. Uh, I am not a financial advisor. I am a financial strategist, really a strategist in general. Uh, and I don't speak like the herd. I, I walk in limited company and sometimes I walk alone and I'm okay with that. Uh, so to change up the intro, uh, the talk show guys continue to push uh, ETFs, the, and mainly bonds and AI. And AI is, it's still pushing the market. And it's, it's partly the AI computer chip software, but it's also just the expanding use of AI through every company. Um, AI is not quite in bubble territory, but it's expanded so much. I'm kind of honestly waiting for it to reset a little bit. Or, or I guess it is in bubble territory and I'm waiting for it to pop. Uh, AI and technology and bonds, that's really where you should have been months ago. If the, I, I call them interesting, uh, interesting noises outside. I call them talk show circle junkies. It's it's like the talking heads. It's the motley fool who, in, from my standpoint, is called fool for a reason. If they're telling you to, chase all these rabbits, it's really the rabbits you should have been chasing six to nine or 12 months ago when they were telling you to chase something else. Um, it's it, If you think of the reach of that group of people, the, the men and women who jump from one talk show to the next um, and talk and say the same things. And this week they're an expert on bonds and next week they're an expert on technology and the next week they're an expert on something else, but they're not really an expert on anything. All of those people are just funneling consumers into a specific path and they're not funneling you in the best possible manner. They're, they want you to pursue a certain object. So they're telling you about it and making it shiny and pretty, but it's honestly where you should have been a couple months ago if not six to nine to 12 months ago. So for the most part, we're still in greed market. And I don't look at a ton of stuff on CNN, but really I don't look at, on anything on CNN except one thing. And that's their fear and greed index. Cause I, it, even though I don't, even though I, I don't, uh, base everything I do on that. I think it's a great look at the overall market. And I, I think it's a really great look at the overall investor market, especially the new investor market. We were in extreme greed. Now with the Federal Reserve um, hinting at either stalling rates or maybe even hiking rates, that pendulum or, or kind of a speedometer of sorts is slowly ticking back down. So where it was cranked to greed or to extreme greed, and now it's falling back into greed. And if we hit fear again, it's going to crank back or it's going to fall back into extreme fear. And that's when I would buy. Unless you find just an outstanding deal on uh, overall price, not just the discount, not just the system we employ, but if you find just an overall like beaten up, downtrodden stock who meets the metrics, and has a lower price than normal, then yeah, by all means. But if you buy into the greed, if you buy into the extreme greed methods that that those uh, circle junkies are pushing, it's not helping you. So 
if we're going to look into closed end funds, right? Even using that strategy, you have to know your strategy. So where would we invest? Where would you invest, right? How would you invest? It comes down to knowing your strategy. So I know our strategy. I know our strategies. But do you know yours? Are you buying low and selling high? Uh, if you're buying technology, you're buying high, hoping it'll go higher before it bursts. Uh, versus one of the funds on our list is transition from bonds to real estate. And it is, uh, it's a beat up real estate sector, or at least it's a beat up real estate fund now, but it really doesn't need to be. Uh, it's kind of overblown fears, but uh, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. So uh, are you buying low and selling high? Are you dollar cost averaging or DCAing your funds? Are you investing for the short term? Are you uh, building something? Are you, say, what kind of portfolio are you building? Are you building uh, consumer, blue chip technology, right? When you look into that, but are, are you building a dividend portfolio? Because that's very different than the standard 60, 40 stock to bond portfolio. Uh, what's your overall end goal? Is your goal to sock away you know a million dollars into the market just to have it and use that four percent rule or are you doing something different so in understanding our advice and understanding our strategy have you ever heard this advice from warren buffett or have you ever heard this quote buy stocks for 66 cents instead of a dollar when you invest in the market and it's just if you think of the market at large you can't do that but you can do that in the closed end fund world. So our strategy is, I mean, our, our strategy, our goal is to supplement or fund a retirement through dividends and not the sell off of funds. So we're not using the 4% rule, which is really more like a 12% rule. 4% uh, without getting into everything. So the, the idea that you've got a million dollars saved, the market will gain 4% a year, so you can take out four percent, uh, so you can take out four percent a year and break even overall, but that's reverse dollar cost averaging. One, so when you dollar cost your way there, you're buying the lows of the market, and when you dollar cost your way out, you might be selling lower than when you want to sell higher. It also doesn't factor in inflation, regardless of what the Fed says. Okay, now the Fed lied to us about manipulating currency so i don't trust anything they say right so they could say inflation is doing amazing they can say it's high and i'm i'm gonna bet it's generally higher so they can say inflation is two percent which is their goal and i'm gonna say it's still probably four percent and if they say it's four percent but our cost at the grocery store is up 30 percent be real do you really believe inflation is just four percent so if inflation is at least 4% a year, then your 4% rule for withdrawing money out of your stock market portfolio is not just 4%. So you're taking out 4%, hoping the market gains 4% break even, but that's not it. You're losing 8% a year, 4% for what you're taking out, 4% for the, for the devaluation of your currency. And that's not all. It's like the, it's like the price is right Except instead of the winner's bracket, it's like the ultimate losing package. When you retire, how much money are you living on? Because if you're taking 40 grand out of the market and hoping to live on that, that's less money than a first year teacher makes. I mean, first year teacher in my area makes about 50 grand. And if you play the system and you're in it the whole time, which is not my goal, but if you're in it the whole time, then you're going to make about, I don't know, 75-ish maybe in 35 years, which is not in as crazy a bonus as it sounds. I mean, the first year teacher might make 50 grand the first year and the next year the salary goes to 50,100. It's not this crazy raise system. So, you're going from a much higher cost of living to 40 grand. So if you're used to living on 70 to 80 grand a year, 
out of a million, that's 8%. So you've got 4% taking out, 4% for inflation, right? But it, instead of that 40 grand, it's more like 80 grand. So that's 8% plus the 4% for inflation. So it's really a 12% plan. And there's no way the market generates 12% a year. So instead of taking out our principal, we want to do dividends. And instead of dollar cost averaging the sell-off of our portfolio, our goal is to leave that money intact and to take the dividends. So it comes down to this. I mean, you've got to know your strategy and you've got to know what you're willing to do. Are you willing to follow the herd and their advice? The 60-40 split of stocks to bonds, the lie of the 4% rule, uh, maybe the bigger lie that everybody will hit a million dollars invested into the market. Um, do you want to take their their recommendations that are probably a year, six months to a year late, right? Or do you want to break away from the herd and do your own thing? And I'll, I'll admit doing our own thing was scary at first, but then the more you do the research, the more reasonable it sounds. So here's our cork board. Here's our strategy. So we use the strategy that I'll get to, unless you have a really good reason for breaking it, which I'll also get to. Um, we're looking for monthly dividends, unless you find an amazing deal on a quarterly player, uh, quarterly payer. We're looking at bonds and senior loans, so long as you can get them cheap, which that's getting harder to do, but it's still possible. So. I'm sure there's a technical difference that someone will want to chime in about at some point, but for now, let, let's kiss it. So between the two, bonds are fixed rate return and senior loans are floating rate and pending who you read, sometimes get paid before bonds. Um, <clears throat> I find the last comment on that unreliable. Uh, bonds are fixed rate, senior loans are floating rate. Uh, we look at energy infrastructure, what could be uh, oil, liquid natural gas, energy transfer, utilities, uh, all oil-based, to be honest. Uh, but if you think how much technology has integrated or invaded our world uh, and know that all of that outstanding technology still requires oil and all of its byproducts. So if you look at semiconductor companies, Right, the people supplying the chips for all these different products. That's an oil byproduct. Uh, if you look at data software management, laptops, software, all of this stuff is oil-based product. So it's not that we're outright investing into microchips, although some of the closed-end funds we own own micro, you know, are a uh, privy or, or have microchip companies inside their, their, their portfolios, but they also have companies that are just beholden to technology. So we're not looking at technology directly like microchip. It's the companies that use and that need an integrated technology. So management of oil, management of liquid natural gas, the energy transfer, getting something from one place to another. Uh, utility, same idea, data and data management, uh, cloud tech, because you can build your company as much as you want, but if you have no way to, to manage all the software, right, and manage everything, so the whole process of what you're making, but also all the customer and clientele stuff, data and data management is huge. It's very much like that Matthew McConaughey commercial where where your data is the goal. Uh Real estate or real estate investment trust. It's it's honestly the more it's the it's what we're looking at, but at the same time, it's risky because I mean, if the Fed cuts rates, real estate will take off. If they hike rates, that's the unknown. I don't know if uh, real estate investment trust overall will will maintain. I don't know if they'll drop a little bit. Um, I, I imagine it more like a ripple. Um, it, 
generally I mean, the, some of the best I got, the best advice I got was like, if you're looking for, I mean, everybody's looking for the, the most amazing deal, but sometimes the best deals are the companies that are just downtrodden for no good reason. And one of which I'll get to. Uh, we're also looking at convertibles and preferred. So the convertible is they can switch between stocks and bonds so long as they hit the right metrics. And then preferreds would be preferred shares. They pay those before they pay common shares. So if we're truly headed towards a recession, which I still think we are, then common share stocks may or may not have dividend cuts. But preferred shares, whether they cut dividends or not, those preferred shares must be paid be before they pay the common share. Um, and with the hovering interest rates, I mean, I like the idea of a convertible. I mean, so I'm not talking about a car, but it's the same idea. Uh, to be able to convert one to the other to optimize your performance in the market, I like that. But also making sure you get preferred dividends. Uh, that sounds like a good thing. So let's look at where the where the discounts are and where the bargains are. So this is the overall closed in fund master ranked alphabetically. Um, without getting into these too heavily, triple asterisk is a buy alert. It means the current discount is both double the historic, at least double the historical, and it's greater than the five year. For a company that's only been around three or four years, the existing discount is greater than the three year discount. And for a new company, like there, are, I think there's two new, like less than a year old companies. Uh, the existing discount is less than that overall average because it's brand new. I mean, it's looking at existing data versus data for the last six months. And for the most part, both companies are trending towards a narrower discount. Um, so even though the existing discount is lower than what it was, or lower, lower than the, like a three month average, there's still pretty amazing discounts. So uh, two asterisks is a dollar cost average alert on our end. And then one asterisk is tracking for any number of reasons. So if we rank by discount and then rank by target, we're gonna take these targets and plop them onto this spreadsheet so we can better look at what we've got. Current just means that we currently own it and I can look at how many shares we currently have. Let me get rid of some, there we go. So blue, we currently own, purple recommended by somebody I trust, um, and green or olive, whatever you wanna call that, uh, interesting for any number of reasons. So our goal has been to target monthly payers. So we can filter out these. Our goal has also been to look at something paying 9% and above. Now that said, we would be foolish to ignore the most extensive discount which is HFRO, and it's been that way. And we've owned this We've owned this fund for a while. It used to be predominantly uh, bonds and senior loans, but they've transitioned the portfolio a little bit. <laughs> uh, sorry, it used to be bonds, but now it's mostly real estate and private senior loans. Uh, and I found this review or this snippet from the uh, contrarian outlook um, and that I'm not uh, posting this and breaking any kind of crazy like not copyrighted not not confidential not any of that this is off a of general email so if you pause this you can read what the snippet says um, but oversold uh, oversold to me is like your fears are overblown. People are worried about it, but at the same time, 
you know, people are worried about it. They cut their dividend in half. Uh, portfolio restructure ahead of what we all hope is a federal rate cut. Uh, but who knows if that'll happen this month. So they're kind of waiting in limbo, really just waiting on the Fed. Um, but even then, that being said, they're still doing a lot better than what people think. So we would be fools to ignore the top discount. But that also means we can get rid of all this stuff. So I've heard this said, but then I'll, ex I'll explain my counter. So when there is a recession, people go into what's needed, which I mean, like utilities, cell phone bills, uh, gasoline, supposedly people aren't going to drive that much, but I, I, I disagree. Uh, but the, the push would be into consumer products, like the staples in somebody's pantry. And while I get that, it's also where people will cut the most. They're going to trim up what they buy and both, both trim up how, how much of what they buy, but also trim up product-wise. And there's no good way to look at that. Like some people, you know, some people will cut the Oreos. Some people will cut the Kraft ketchup. Some people like who knows, but it, it's also a very volatile market, especially in a global fund. And I found that I'm willing to deal with some global funds, but consumer has not been my favorite, my favorite category. I mean, real estate is a consumer product, but uh, it's almost like it, it deserves its own category. Um, but the, the cyclical nature of things, like when most people buy cars or grills or when most people do yardware or uh, like most people buy a mattress in April or when uh, kids go to college, like the cyclical nature of buying, that's a consumer-based product. <laughs> and it's, it's very volatile from my standpoint. Now, some people love that area of the market, the, and these two fund, these two Calamo funds have been on my watch list for a while. Uh, one, they're run by Calamos, uh, but two, they pay well, and three, they fit the target system. That said, I'm not a huge proponent of the consumer market space. It's got to be just an amazing deal, which I mean, both of these are. That's why they make the list. But it's got to be a, a like a better deal than something else I could get that's already on the list. And their portfolio doesn't necessarily hit our targets right now. Um, yeah. So even though they're at 9%, even though, even though they pay above 9%, they don't make the cut. So that leaves us with this. So you got floating rate loans, right? Like senior loans, plus a really big uh, inbuilt closed end fund portfolio. Now. You've got not quite a portfolio in a can, but close. It, it, that's predominantly real estate, energy, utilities, and bonds. Um, also, so real estate, energy, like data management, utilities, bonds. These are global bond funds. They're invested in AI. Uh, two thirds of it is is based in in the U.S. Their sister funds. Uh, this is the All American Bond Company, which I like that idea. This is technology, and it's it's been recommended by two different people within the same company. But as you can see, the data is almost a year and a half old, uh, and technology's in the bubble, like it's at the it's climbing. And I'm honestly, I don't want to cut our profits in half, like our we have 50 shares at 9.93, and I only know that because I looked at it the other day. So, because it would be an equal share. Uh, 
that would bring our overall right to this so that the difference except it'd be positive well let's see can we go positive no so 0.77 times 100 it's just not worth it to me i'd rather wait until the bubble pops and then buy it at a much lower cost and then the most expensive discount then you get the most expensive discount which is predominantly real estate and senior loans so where would we go like if we were going to buy tomorrow what would we buy well we own everything in blue and it's almost equal landscape of what we have we don't own anything we don't own the purple um let's see that's currently higher than the averages for your company 30 percent is higher right both of these are similar uh it's really a year less but, but it's like a it's a year old company so the highest it's been when it opened was 24% off. Uh, currently, a, you know, 16% off. So instead of it being, what is that, 76 for every, for every dollar you're investing, you're paying 76 cents. Now it's for every dollar you're investing, you're paying, it's you're paying 84 cents for every dollar you're investing. Uh, so it's still a really great deal. And it's a bump. It, it's, I like it because it's an American-based bond company. It's based, yes, it's extrinsically based upon the general world economy, but it's really based upon the American economy, which you can argue for and against, versus the global bond fund has a little more variance to it. Uh, but what I do like about these is they're convertible bonds. Like they, they have a high... Uh, capacity high rate of convertibles so they can convert between stocks and bonds so all of these are great but what would we buy well as it is we're not going to buy anything until we sell some stuff um, we need to sell a couple things um, working on selling this it's a lot of people talk about this fund and their dividend goes up and down. Uh, what I dislike is that it pays quarterly. I mean, I, it'd be amazing if it were a monthly payer, but I knew it paid quarterly when we bought it. But what I also found out is it's a dividend reinvestment program and it's an automatic drip. So we bought it and they pay us a dividend to take it back and they trade us overall shares. So it's, it's increased our return of investment Right, you wouldn't think that was possible, because I mean, that's our buy-in price, which means it would have to be if if we didn't get the fractional shares in in, uh, in offset of dividend, then it would have to be worth eight thirty four in order for us to be break even on price. But that's the return. Like we're ahead because of the fractional shares. And that just means whenever they give us a dividend, and I just add them all together, whenever they pay us a dividend, they pay us a dividend and then debit it from the account and, and trade us fractional shares into the company. And that's nice, but I would much rather have a dividend in hand because yes, $11 is not, not that much, but it might be the difference between me buying something and not buying something. And I would much rather have that in my hand than have fractional shares. Uh, same thing for this company. Um, so USA recently paid, the, I mean, they paid, in, I want to say they paid at the beginning of the month. So uh, I'm working on selling this company. And once this company pays its next dividend, we will be selling this company. Um then I need to do a general portfolio to review to kind of go over the rest of the stuff. But 
once we sell those funds, we will reinvest the money based upon our strategy of looking at the discount. So do they meet the target system, monthly payer, right? Overall yield, unless we have a really good reason to break that uh, 9% rule. But where would I go if I could invest? Uh, like if we were going to pick up 50 shares, we would pick up 50 shares here. Um, and I mean, we could play the what if game all day. If we had, what if we had a thousand dollars, what would we buy? I think we go with the same idea. I think we go with the hosh bombs, real estate only, and bonds, and you get a really snazzy deal. Um, and having done this already, so I mean, you're picking up a hundred. So remember 105.9. So 105.9 divided by what was spent, right, times gives you over 10% annual yield paid monthly. Um, yeah, but we're not buying tomorrow. So if we were buying tomorrow, we would buy here. Um, I don't know when the recession would hit. Maybe we're in it and they've just changed the terminology and it's getting squashed from all sides. So it's really hard to hear right now. Um, but I still think recession coming, um, evidenced by everybody's, I won't say everybody, uh, outside of one specific company I read, uh, a lot of people are uh, continuing to say how amazing the economy is when you and I know that's uh, not true because we can still see that at the grocery store. You know, we can feel that in our paychecks, what, what our money cannot buy. Uh, but I can also tell you that based on subjective data from looking at Facebook, I look at a lot of different things on Facebook Marketplace, but one of my favorite areas to search is classic cars. And there are so many fun classic cars for sale on Facebook, some in decent territory, but for the most part, all of those prices are dropping. Like I saw a post the other day, price firm, but that original $4,000 price got crossed out to be replaced by 2000, right? So a month of no movement on 4,000 on a decent car, um, prices are dropping because people are unwilling to pay. Like people are offloading their toys because they can't, pay for them and have fun with them. But at the same time, the market they're selling to isn't willing to just offload four grand to buy a decent car. So I think as the overall uh, availability on marketplace of cars, furniture, everything else uh, slowly builds up, you're, we're going to see a continued drop in overall value. And if you're looking to score a classic car at a great deal, it's a phenomenal time to buy. That being said, that tells me that inflation is still coming. And the people who were promising us six Federal Federal Reserve rate cuts this year are now wondering if they're going to cut rates at all. Um, yeah. Somebody I read was like, maybe the Fed's going to go hawkish and increase rates until the recession hits. And that's like, doesn't make me leery, but it makes me really concerned because if the Fed has been saying, look how amazing we've been doing and suddenly raises rates that says they were lying. One, they were lying in general because it wasn't going well, which I knew they were lying, but that just tells me I even I uh, didn't realize how bad it was based on the information they were telling us. Um, so knowing that, or maybe not knowing that, maybe the Fed maybe the Fed comes out and pauses rates. That's better than a rate increase to a degree. That doesn't really help anybody. That doesn't help overall approval. Uh, doesn't really help overall sentiment. I mean, the truth be told, there's not a huge difference between six point five and six point two five. It makes you feel better that you're getting a quarter percent off, but the quarter percent doesn't really do a ton to your overall payment. So, I mean, yeah, the real estate market is beaten up, 
Um, but in a recession, I mean, real estate, bonds, convertibles, utilities, I mean, senior loans, I mean, they're all great. But knowing what we're going to sell and then what we would buy, and, know, and what you don't know that this portfolio, not so much revamp, but what we need to sell inside the portfolio. Um, let's see if I scale these. So I would go here. There, um, wrong one, there. I mean, those are the same company. It, BRW, it, yes, it's floating rate loans in this massive closed and fund portfolio, but th we're investing in different closed and funds, which says, yes, I get access to a lot more closed and funds than what I have but it might not be closed in funds I want. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of split. Now that being said, it, yes, it meets the target number, you know, it meets the discount issue. It meets the target issue. It meets the yield it pays monthly. It's a great deal. Um, it's a great deal, but compared to everything else, it would, in, in in our strategy of sorts, it would be last on our list. So if we were buying tomorrow, and I, I like fifty shares, I, I do. I do. I mean, you can look at the portfolio of how we started. It was just buy what we could buy. Uh, but I like the fifty share concept, where we're buying fifty shares of everything, unless we're buying like a hundred shares right off the bat. Uh, but if we were buying tomorrow, that's what we would buy. Yeah, and if we had more money at play, well, then we would play some more. So that's all I got. Otherwise, I will continue talking in circles. Uh, if you like the content, consider subscribing to my channel. Hit the like button. Head over to Facebook. Join my group there called Navigate Your Finances. And the information will be below as you face the week. And on the, on the teaching front, there are nine weeks to the school year for the most part left. Maybe your, Maybe your school goes a week longer but there are just nine weeks left to the school year. Um, that's crazy to me. Crazy. So much crazy that we've come this far, crazy that we only have that amount left and then it's summer. And then, uh, yeah. But as you face your week, as you face the rest of the month, as you look forward into the end of the general school year and into the summer, your boat will go where you lead it. Your boat will go where you steer it. If you know where you are and you know where you're going, you're on a good path, right? That you can always change. You can always change the course, right? But if you have no idea where you are or, and, and, or, or, and, you have no idea where you're going and you have no strategy in use to help you get from where you are to where you're going, you're going to waste a lot of time. Right? And you're not going to set yourself up well to get to where you want to go. So head over to Facebook and check out my group there because that's what I talk about there. But when it comes to a stock market investment strategy, know your strategy. Because I don't guide your purpose more than anything else you find online. Know what it is that you want to do. right, And then figure out how to make it happen. Captain your ship. Don't let all these other people steer for you. Captain your ship. Make your dreams happen. Get from where you are to where you want to be. And then as you learn along the way, once you get to where you want to be, you will know how to stay there and keep going. Right? But wherever it is that you want to go will not happen on its own. Okay, if you let your boat turn in circles, it will turn in circles. It will not miraculously pop off the water and end up on that desert island with the, with the pirate's chest. It's just not going to happen. Make your dreams happen. So take the wheel, steer the boat, know where you want to go. Um, yeah, it really comes down to that. It's Your job is figure out where you are, figure out where you want to go, and then figure out how to get there. Steer your boat, captain your ship, 
make your dreams happen. Have a great week. I will see you all on another video. Bye-bye.